This conference will now be recorded. According to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our growth comes through the scriptures. We are in Colossians chapter 2 this morning, looking at verses 1 through 7. Colossians 2, verses 1 through 7. As we divide the chapter into three portions, the first segment is verses 1 through 7. The second is verses 9 through 15. And the third portion, we will handle verse 8 and 16 through 23, taking verse 8 and uh, connecting it with where it belongs in verses 16 through 23. Paul interrupted himself when he uh, began a corrective matter in verse 8, and then he interrupted himself with uh, a marvelous text centering on the occupation with Christ and the blessings of his work on our behalf. And uh, that interruption is verses 9 through 15. And then he resumed the uh, chief corrective matter that he introduced in verse 8. And uh, he resumed that in verse 16 and took it to the end of the chapter. So we'll handle it in those three segments. For this morning, though, uh, we're dealing with the, uh, the problem when you cannot uh, be face to face. And it's quite appropriate since that's our problem <laughs> as a church. Austin Bible Church cannot be face to face. We are uh, under quarantine and lockdown and house arrest and everything else that uh, the people are describing it like. But we are sitting here at home agonizing over uh, not being face to face. So thankfully, we have go to meeting, we have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have all kinds of other capacities to uh, to be virtually face to face, even when we can't be physically face to face. And so we're uh, we're dealing with that here. Before we get started, let's take a moment for silent prayer, asking for our Father's faithfulness, the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. Shall we pray? Almighty Father, we come before you this morning, thankful for your faithfulness. Thankful, Father, that we are able to worship in spirit and in truth. Thank you for the capacity that we have to meet virtually. It is your grace provision that makes this possible. And we're asking for your grace provision to continue, Father, that we can adapt, maybe not exactly what we're doing now with GoToMeeting, but something similar to that, that we can do uh, even when many of us return to the church building. We know that there will be some who cannot or will not return to the church building. And so we need wisdom and guidance for the logistical grace to keep the streaming uh, happening and uh, whatever Whatever is required to do that, Father, uh, grant the wisdom and expertise and the finances to uh, to make that happen as well. So, uh, Father, we do thank you again that you are faithful day by day, moment by moment. We thank you and we praise you, Father, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right. So uh, stay tuned. I don't want to say a whole lot here while we're being recorded <laughs> and while this is going on on the website, but. We are uh, adapting to our circumstances, and part of that adapting is uh, is financial. And so uh, pray for our treasurer, pray for our deacons, and uh, pray for our congregation as we, uh, as we accept God's will in this time. All right, so looking at verses one through seven, and we'll get uh, the Bible overlay here so we can see the verses for what they are. Colossians 2 verses one through seven and uh hopefully we're not getting too accustomed to this you still own your own bibles and you can still read for yourself and you're not uh, getting so lazy that you just sit there and stare at a screen while your pastor reads the verses to you but here we have it all right i want you to know how great a struggle i have on your behalf and for those who are at laodicea and for all those who have not personally seen my face that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. 
Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. All right, so this is the paragraph. This is the section that we're handling as a unit, as an expository outline in developing this, uh, this first portion of the chapter. And it's the struggle. It's the struggle because he can't be there. He's never been there. Uh, they don't recognize his struggle. They don't recognize his prayer life on their behalf. And they don't see the benefit uh, that Ephesus sees, the benefit of being knit together. And so he's praying that even with him being absent, they will still respond to the teaching and be knit together, that the, the Holy Spirit will knit them together, that the Lord will knit them together in love. And then all the benefits that happen once you've been knit together, all the great things that happen when you've been knit together. And we can start to think of this in a way similar to, um, similar to how we talk about salvation and where we have a, a, a portfolio of assets. We have salvation grace blessings that we've taught before and Pastor Cliff has taught before and others that when you get saved, there's this portfolio of assets that you receive by virtue of being saved. And uh, 33 of them that Schaefer came up with, or 36, 39, different pastors have listed them in different ways. I think John Eichmann's up to 160-something, the, the portfolio of assets that we have at the moment we get saved. Now, this is similar to that, but this is a collective portfolio of assets. This is uh, what a congregation receives when a congregation is knit together in love. And so a congregation becomes knit together in love. Well, what happens as a result of that? What is the outcome of that? What, what comes from that? And so we start to see this, this uh, paragraph actually lists a number of things, including the heart encouragement. Their hearts may be encouraged having been knit together in love. And the grammar and the syntax of this demands that the knitting has to come first and that the heart encouragement is a consequence. It is a benefit, it is an outcome. So if you don't knit the hearts together, the, uh, if you don't knit the believers together, then the hearts will not be encouraged. That uh, the one produces the other. And that's not the only thing that it produces because the, the knit together heart encouragement then leads to a chain of other consequences. Wealth, full assurance, understanding, true knowledge, all of these things form a chain. And, uh, and then beyond that, we have, uh, down, when you get down to verse five, you see good discipline and stability. And those are marvelous benefits for any local church. A local church needs to have good discipline. A local church needs to have stability. And, uh, the, and the way to get that is what we're studying here to be knit together in love and to have the heart encouragement. So these things are all linked and, and really the vocabulary is, uh, is, is important, but more than that, it's the grammar, it's the syntax. And so I've been showing this, I started on Wednesday. We got pretty grammatical on Wednesday and uh, I'm not sure how much more of that we'll be seeing here this morning, but everything that I colored yellow, you see it's highlighted yellow uh, in this verse. Uh, they are italics uh, usually, in the New American Standard print edition, they are italics text because they are not in the Greek. They are supplied by English translators to try to connect these terms. And not all of them are italics. The, um, this one here, the wealth that comes from, the wealth that comes from is not italics. It is uh, kept as standard text, but it's also given a, a footnote where you have an alternate reading, you have a literal reading. The literal reading in italics is of the full assurance, of the full assurance. And really we have a, a long string of ofs here. Uh, so many ins and ofs and attaining tos and that is, all of these connecting uh, particles, these connecting expressions, none of them are in the Greek. And they're, uh, they're all connected by, generally they're connected by the genitive case. And so in this, uh, in this chain of expressions, I went ahead and colored them yellow because the attaining to, we need to discuss, is attaining to the best way to, to render that? So 
having been knit together in love, their hearts may be encouraged, resulting in, attaining to, apprehending, is what I'm going to settle on, is apprehending the all wealth, the infinite wealth that comes from, or the infinite wealth of, what kind of wealth? Are we, are we going to have uh, Bill Gates wealth? Are we going to have Michael Dell wealth? Are we going to have uh, earthly wealth of billions of, of uh, American dollars? What kind of wealth are we going to have? Because whatever wealth we're going to have, we've got all of it. <laughs> so uh, we want to know what kind of wealth is it that we have all of, because we have it all, all the wealth that comes from attaining to, apprehending the full assurance of understanding. So not only are we apprehending we're understanding, and that's giving us the full assurance, the full conviction, the full pleroma, the fullness of understanding, and then the resulting in. So wait a minute, resulting in, uh, that's, that's also italics, in a true knowledge of God's mystery. Well, what's God's mystery? That is to say Christ himself, and even the himself is italics, because it's not in the Greek either. And uh, I don't know, 25 years of pastoring and of all the Greek puzzles I've ever done, uh, this, uh, this text has um, uh, puzzle after puzzle after puzzle after puzzle, and good men have made different interpretive choices to, uh, to link these all together in the way that we're linking them all together. In a sense, we've got about seven different nouns putting them together in a, in a long train, if you will. Think of each of these nouns, each of these concepts as a train, uh, a car of, of a train. And then what, what links those together? What is, the, what is the connection, the connecting joint that is linking these, these car trains together? And, uh, and so um, having been in love, attaining to, that comes from, of, resulting in, of, that is, himself, all these little connecting uh, prepositional phrases or, or particles, all these little connective expressions, they're, most of them are just of. <laughs> we could read this verse with nothing but, you know, seven or eight ofs in between each of these, uh, each of these expressions and, uh, and, and create more confusion for ourselves than it's worth. So, all of that is to say we got our work cut out for us to uh, to retranslate this and i'm going to give you a full translation once we finish verses one through three once we get through the uh, the hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge once we get through because this is gnosis once we get through the uh, hidden i think it's gnosis the hidden yeah the hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge um once we finish that then uh, I'll back up and I'll give you the overall translation of one through three based upon the work that we're doing here. Okay, so I'm going to skip forward because we've we've done a lot. Let me just skip forward here to, nope, there. A love-knit local church. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm willing to stand before my flock today and declare that Austin Bible Church is a love-knit local church, that we are a love-knit local church on the basis of the whole council face-to-face -face teaching that we submit to, the whole council face-to-face -face teaching that Jesus Christ blesses us with as an assembly. So a love-knit local church becomes a storehouse and dispensary of all wealth. That's what the verse is saying here in verse 2b and in verse 3. In verse 2b and in verse 3. That having been knit together, having been knit together in love, that's Austin Bible Church, that's Ephesus, as Paul, as Paul is describing it, and that's uh, hopefully going to be Colossae, when they can uh, realize the, uh, the benefits of what he's teaching here. But a love-knit local church becomes a storehouse and a dispensary. And all of that centers on this attaining to all the wealth. Attaining to all the wealth. So not only is it a storehouse, in other words, um, it's, uh, there's wealth that's deposited there. There's wealth that's, uh, that's there. 
but what good is it to just store it? What good is it to have it uh, stockpiled, to have it, you know, it's like um, in Puerto Rico after that last uh, uh, hurricane came through and they had storehouses full of bottled water, but they weren't dispensing it. They weren't giving it out. It wasn't available for the people to make use of. And so a storehouse that's not also a dispensary is useless, um, particularly for the kind of wealth that uh, is being addressed here, the kind of wealth that a local church becomes. Uh, Austin Bible Church is not a storehouse of, of US dollars. We're not a storehouse and a dispensary of billions of dollars, trillions of dollars, whereby uh, you can just walk in and show up and we'll be throwing money at people. That's not the kind of wealth that we have. That's not the storehouse and dispensary of wealth that, uh, that Paul's writing about here. It's a different kind of wealth. And it's, uh, it's a marvelous kind of wealth, as we're going to see. And, uh, and it's infinite because it's all, it's all wealth. So we don't just want to be a storehouse. We also want to be a dispensary. Remember the man that Jesus rebuked? He had barns and his barns were full. And because his barns were full, the only solution he could come up with was to build bigger barns. It never occurred to him to become a dispensary that he could bless his neighbors, he could bless his family, he could bless others that were in need, that uh, given the fact that his, uh, his, his warehouses were full, that he had more than he needed, that he, uh, he could have also become a dispensary, he could become a conduit, a provision. And this is what God has for us, that we receive the grace of God and we also dispense the grace of God, that we are a conduit, a channel for God's grace in and through us that, uh, that he's designed us for. And so that's what we spent Wednesday night going through. I made a demonstration for you of the difficult grammatical options for the chain of prepositions and genitives within this passage. And I shared with you an, an exegetical summary that, uh, that maybe for a lot of folks, it, it bored you to tears. And, I, and I, I'm not going to apologize for that because, um, <laughs> because we're not in the same room and I'm on camera and can't see your cameras. Never once did I see the, the eyes glaze over with, with, uh, with the, the boredom of the, of the grammar. But I think it's, it's critical that we recognize that. Everything you see colored in yellow, attaining to, that's debatable, all right? And different people will translate it in different ways. Open up seven Bibles and you'll see different translations of the attaining to. Um, because what it is that connects the encouraged hearts with the wealth is 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 syntax not vocabulary attaining to all the wealth the next debate that comes from or of okay is it just a simple of and if it's a if it's a genitive of is it an objective genitive or a subjective genitive how do we handle the of so the wealth that comes from kind of like that that comes from or uh, a different expression besides coming from, but it, because it's defining the kind of wealth, the kind of wealth that we have. We have all of it, but what kind is it? The wealth of full assurance. Great. We want to have full assurance. We want to be confident, but confident in what? We don't just have confidence in confidence itself, okay? Um, what kind of confidence, what kind of full assurance, what kind of pleroma do we have as we are being perfected, as we are being completed in Christ? The completed, the complete full assurance of understanding. But understanding what? Epinosis. Ep epinosis of what? Epinosis of mystery. Well, what's the mystery? That's Christ. Christ himself. Christ in you. The hope of glory. All these things. So we got to we, we have our work in front of us. And so far, we've uh, we're still dealing with wealth. The uh, the hearts encouraged um, attaining to all the wealth. OK, so that's kind of the big picture here. We're going to we're going to solve all of these mysteries. And maybe as we do, I'll come along and I'll remove the yellow color so that I can indicate. All right. We've uh, we've solved that. We've uh, we've made the interpretive choice. Then instead of attaining to, we're going to select apprehending as uh, as a better English sense for the uh, the connection. Attaining to or 
apprehending. And the reason why I like apprehending is because of the sister epistle of Ephesians and how this idea is communicating there, attaining to all wealth. And you can, you can recognize there's different ways to come into wealth. You can earn it, you can work for it, you can inherit it, you can find it, you can steal it, you can, um, you can obtain wealth in different ways. And, uh, and then once we understand the kind of wealth, if it's a wealth of understanding, uh, then the way that you can attain to a wealth of understanding uh, is you can't inherit it or just receive it without the effort of study. Uh, the wealth of understanding comes about through uh, apprehending. You've got to learn it. You've got to learn it and you've got to embrace it and you've got to make use of it. You've got to claim ownership of it. That's the, the full um, process for this kind of wealth. How do you apprehend or how do you attain to this kind of wealth? How do you acquire this kind of wealth? Because it's not just information. It's not just knowing something. We're going to get to the, uh, to the uh, wisdom and knowledge but it's not just knowing it or being wise, it's embracing it, claiming it, possessing it, apprehending it, claiming ownership of it, living it out. And that's, uh, that's, a, that's a process. And uh, until, you, until you get a taste for it, until you see it among others, this is why we're being knit together is so useful because we can encourage this amongst ourselves, one to another. And that uh, that this wealth is is useful, and uh, and and you'll see what I mean by that. All right. So we introduced Plutos for you on Wednesday. Plutos is the word for wealth, and uh, it's a word we're familiar with. We saw it in Philippians 4:19, when uh, we we want to our God will supply all your needs according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So God's the rich one, and uh, and He provides all our needs, and so. Because he's infinitely wealthy, what need do we have that he's insufficient for? What uh, shortcoming do we have where God uh, fails us? He lets us down. Uh, he never does. He absolutely never, never does. Now, um, we covered most of these already. I'm not going to repeat everything that we read on Wednesday, but I do want to just um, kind of refresh our thinking that the Bible talks about multiple kinds of wealth, that there's earthly wealth and there's biblical wealth. Uh, there's physical wealth and spiritual wealth, and uh, and those contrast there. And and as Second Corinthians eight indicates, you can have secular temporal poverty and be incredibly wealthy, overflowing with with wealth. And that was the case for the Macedonian churches, that their deep poverty overflowed in the plutos, in the wealth of their liberality. And so uh, that that may seem contradictory. It may seem to be an oxymoron. It may seem to not make any sense how you can be dirt poor in in uh, in earthly dollars and yet the richest man on earth in the spiritual capacity of your generosity and that's uh, that's what we see so matthew 13 mark 4 luke 8 those are all parallel synoptic uh, accounts of the parable of the sower where we realize that earthly wealth can be a snare that if you have a lot of money a lot of times that chokes out your fruitfulness and you get sidetracked. It's called deceitful. The deceitfulness of riches can, uh, it's, the thorny, it's a thorny ground circumstance of believers in that parable, whereby the deceitfulness of wealth uh, uh, is what chokes out their fruitfulness. It's not having wealth, but it's being deceived by the things that wealth will deceive you in. And uh, when you get deceived by that wealth, you lose your uh, your fruitfulness, and that's that's the warning that uh, we have to give to people on this earth with that kind of wealth. Romans two four though introduced uh, a different kind of wealth, the wealth of kindness. Do you think lightly of the uh, kindness? Let me bring that back up here. Romans two four. Do you think lightly? of the Plutos, the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience. And so this is an entirely different kind of wealth. This is not earthly wealth. This is not US dollars. You can't track this on a balance sheet or it doesn't show up in a profit and loss statement anywhere. Uh, kindness and tolerance and patience. So uh, work on those traits. You've got fruit of the spirit benefits there and, uh, and uh, 
through kindness and tolerance and patience, we can become extremely wealthy uh, by letting the word of God do the work and transform our thinking and transform our character. And the more kind we become, the more enduring we become, the more uh, tolerant we become. And of course, you got vocabulary studies to do on all of this. The um, I'm trying to remind myself what some of these are. There we go. Uh, but as we develop these character traits through our transformation, uh, we're becoming rich. We're becoming personally rich. And becoming personally rich helps us to function in the storehouse and dispensary of all wealth that we are commanded to function in, in uh, Colossians chapter 2. We can go to church and we can go to Austin Bible Church and properly operate within the storehouse and dispensary of the wealth that is Austin Bible Church. So that's a different kind of wealth. That's not U.S. dollars. The riches of kindness and tolerance and patience. And is there any limit to that? Is there anything keeping you from, uh, from um, you know, Forbes doesn't keep a list like of this, like Forbes keeps a list of, of America's top billionaires and so forth. And it, you know, they jockey for position in the top, the top five spots. Uh, Forbes does not keep a list of the richest, uh, the riches of kindness and tolerance and patience, but God does. God keeps that balance sheet and he keeps that ledger. And uh, that's part of what gets rewarded at uh, at the judgment seat of Christ. So that's an entirely different kind of wealth that we see there. In Ephesians, we see a different kind of wealth. I'm not gonna, again, we're not repeating everything we did on Wednesday, but the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. So recognize the more grace-oriented we receive, uh, the, more, uh, the more grace-oriented we become. This is why legalists have such a trouble. Because uh, church age legalists uh, that fail to uh, to think in grace expressions, um, they're so poor. Uh, church age legalists are poverty stricken. They are they don't have the wealth that comes, the riches, the plutos that comes from embracing the grace of God. That is receiving it and dispensing it. We are a storehouse and a dispensary of grace. And so God pours his grace into us and we pour it into everybody. And as a storehouse and a dispensary of grace, we are wealthy, that we have the Plutus riches of his grace. And again, it's all of it that he has poured forth to us. That's Ephesians 1.18. We can read through the rest of what he's given us here in these other verses. But then we see Paul's prayer life. And this is the prayer life that's parallel to the prayer life for the believers in Colossae, all right? Ephesus was the church where he was, where he was face-to-face -face for three years and ministering. They were not ignorant of his struggle. Colossae was ignorant of his struggle. And the prayer life is communicated here in a way that Colossae was unaware of. But these, these epistles are parallel. Coloss Colossians and Ephesians are the sister epistles whereby we, we use each one to help interpret the other. And so when he says here in terms of praying, he says, I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. And that's going to be epinosis, the full knowledge of him. Same epinosis that we're going to see shortly in uh, Colossians 2. I pray that, or just that, the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. And that's why I'm making the choice that apprehending is uh, the, the best rendering of, of this wealth that we're not attaining to, we're apprehending because we already have it. We just need our eyes open to see what we have. Every believer has it. Even the ignorant legalist has this kind of wealth. He just doesn't know that he has this kind of wealth. He needs his eyes opened to apprehend the wealth that God's given us. That the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? And uh, even the most ignorant legalist that's, that's unaware of this kind of power, it's still available to him. 
He just needs to learn and grow and increase his capacity to recognize it for what it is and to accept it for what it is, to become a storehouse and a conduit, to become a, a, uh, a storehouse and a dispensary for this kind of uh, power, as well as this kind of wealth, as well as this kind of grace, as well as this kind of wisdom. So stay tuned for that. That's Ephesians 1 and verse 18. Ephesians 2, 7, even before we understand by grace you've been saved through faith, we have verse 7, in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace. So we have uh, the, the riches of his kindness, the riches of his grace, right? Remember that? If, uh, Romans 2 is the riches of his kindness. Ephesians 1 is the riches of his grace. But now he combines those and uh, shows that in the ages to come, we're talking millennium and fullness of time, God the Father is gonna show the surpassing riches. If you think we've got a lot of riches now because we have pan, uh, we have pan plutos, we have all riches. Well, all riches is about to get expanded. The all riches is, uh, is gonna be multiplied in the ages to come. There's gonna be surpassing riches. This is where we have surpassing grace, greater grace, super grace to quote a uh, a departed houston pastor that i love right the super grace blessings of uh, of colonel rb theme and, and baraka church okay we have the surpassing riches of his grace and so how do you have more than all how do you have more than all because he fills our cup we have all the wealth we have pan plutos all wealth well what happens when he gives us a bigger cup and then he fills that one up <laughs> okay we still have all but it's all in a in an expanded in an expanded capacity so we have all now in in the church capacity just wait until we have all in the fullness of time capacity because that's uh that's a different that's a different grace blessing altogether all right and so there's there's the wealth that happens there ephesians 3 8 and 16 the unfathomable riches of Christ, the unfathomable riches. And I suspect, uh, because he's talking about the revealing of mystery doctrine, bringing to light what is the administration of the mystery, that the unfathomable riches comes from the context of the Jew and the Gentile before Christ, before the church. That in the age of the, of the Gentiles from Adam to Abraham, in the age of the Jews from Abraham to Christ, in those prior dispensations, in those prior stewardships, in other words, before the church age, for any believer before the church age, this kind of wealth is unfathomable. The unfathomable riches of Christ. No Gentile believer, you know, with Job, Noah, Enoch, Methuselah, you know, no Gentile believer would have ever fathomed the Plutus that you and I have. No Jewish believer under law, no Jewish believer in the Old Testament under promise or law. And so, you know, John the Baptist was the greatest uh, of the Old Testament saints. He wouldn't, he couldn't fathom the riches that we have in Christ. Daniel, think of all the great doctrine that Daniel fathomed or, or you know, tremendously mature believers that had a grasp for eschatology in the future and the coming Christ. They never fathomed the riches that you and I have in Christ. And so the pan Plutus that we have, the pan Plutus, the all wealth that we have, the, uh, it's unfathomable from an Old Testament perspective. And to bring to light the dispensation of the mystery, which for ages has been hidden in God. Even the angels couldn't grasp this. Even the angels never had a clue, which is why they crucified the Lord of glory. And we'll see that in Colossians 2. So this is the, the all wealth that we have. And uh, again, prayer request. I bow my knees before the Father. That's Ephesians 3.14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. Here's the prayer. Verse 16, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. And then verse 18, to comprehend. 
There's things that we can only comprehend through prayer as the Father grants us the understanding of these things. So stay tuned for that. Of course, Philippians 4.19, my God will supply our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. If you're looking, uh, <laughs> you know, if you've got some needs that you think are going to be supplied according to the, um, the balanced checkbook, that's not what it says. It says according to the riches in glory in Christ Jesus. That's a different kind of wealth. That's the wealth we're studying here today. The spiritual wealth of the royal family of God. What kind of access do you have? What kind of, you know, as a, as a storehouse and as a dispensary? You can go in there, but you can also draw funds from it. And uh, and what are we doing with this wealth? All right. And, and it's, it's kind of curious to me. Have you been watching the news? You've been watching uh, uh, Harry and, and Meghan and, and their departure from the royal household? And, uh, and uh, you know, they no longer have the perks, they no longer have the privileges, they can't use some of the titles they used to be able to use, and they can't draw on some of the funds they used to draw from. And uh, all of their participation in the House of Windsor, uh, is it, yeah, still the House of Windsor? Anyway, all of the, the uh, Robert will tell me after class, all of the, uh, the riches they used to be able to draw from, they can't draw from that anymore, okay? So that's my illustration, uh, the, the analogy, if you will, for uh, our position in the royal family of God in Christ, that we have a storehouse and a dispensary of all wealth. And uh, we, can, we can tap into it, we can draw from it, we can make expenditures out of it, uh, because we are royal family. This is what we get when we are knit together in love and, we're, and our hearts are encouraged. And we apprehend the pan plutos. We apprehend the all wealth that is our birthright in Christ. And so, uh, of course, earthly needs, what are those compared to the all wealth that we have in Christ? Colossians 1.27, even before we get to 2.2, 2, uh, you might recall that back in chapter 1, we have the, uh, the all wealth. And uh, this is uh, similar to what we just saw a few moments ago in Ephesians. God willed to make known what is the riches, the riches, the positional truth, riches. It was hidden in past ages and generations, but it has now been manifest to whom God will to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. It was unfathomable to the Gentiles, unfathomable to the Jews, and not revealed to the Jewish scriptures. Remember, uh, before Christ, all the scriptures were Hebrew scriptures given to the Jewish people. They were uh, entrusted with the oracles of God. That's why their advantage was great in every respect. And yet unfathomable to the Gentiles, unfathomable to the Jews, but made known to us, to the neither Jew nor Gentile, bride of Christ, the riches of this glory, of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is the mystery? Okay. When we define mystery doctrine, very frequently we define mystery doctrine as the information concerning Jew and Gentile together, one body in Christ. But really, the mystery is Christ, the body of Christ, us in Christ. All of that is the mystery, not the information about it, the thing itself. I'll hope to uh, describe that better as we work our way through this. All right, now, 1 Timothy 6.17. First Timothy, whoops, first Timothy 6, 17. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. So if you're going to contrast earthly riches with heavenly riches, uh, one of those is uncertain. It is not God's, okay? It's earthly wealth that's uncertain. God's wealth is very certain. God's wealth is eternal and uh, very certain, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. All right, so this is our handle on wealth. Hebrews 11, 26, James 5, 2, Revelation 5, 12, Revelation 18, 17. There's coming a destruction of, of uh, commercial Babylon 
and it could happen in one hour, it can happen in a short period of time. In one hour, such great wealth has been laid waste. We consider what our nation's going through now and this virus and uh, how much of our economy has disappeared, how much of our wealth has, has been laid waste. And uh, not just the Dow Jones, not just the stock market, but jobs that are gone and will they come back? Can they come back? Uh, think about wealth disappearing in the few short weeks that we've been under quarantine here. Well, that's nothing. It's just a preview of coming attractions. It's the beginning of birth pangs. Uh, what's going to happen when uh, commercial Babylon is thrown down in, in Revelation, in, in the uh, second half of the tribulation? It's going to be extraordinary. And every shipmaster, every passenger and sailor, they're going to they're gonna cry out and they're going to say, wow, what do we do now? Uh, verse 19, woe, woe, the great city in which all who had ships at sea become rich by her wealth. In one hour, she has been laid waste. The entire global infrastructure of, of world trade is destroyed. And uh, heaven can rejoice, but the earth is wailing away. This is what happens when commercial Babylon is destroyed. And there goes the entertainment, and there goes the fun and games. It's gone. All right. I just realized that much of that was redundant from Wednesday. I thought I had failed to, uh, I thought we had stopped there and we've actually gone all the way there. Okay, well, let's advance. The uh, unlimited infinite wealth. This is what we apprehend. We apprehend the unlimited infinite wealth. Because once we decide what kind of wealth it is, that it's heavenly, not earthly, once we decide that it's God's wealth, not man's wealth, then we recognize, well, exactly in what form does that wealth take? What kind of God's wealth is this? Because it's, is it kindness? Is it grace? Is it, uh, we've seen other elements of God's wealth that have been described in, in more particular fashions. So too here is God's wealth defined in a more particular fashion. But we understand that it's all of it. The omni, and, and to make it Latin would be omni divitius, like uh, dives and, and divitius for wealth. Uh, I just don't like the term omni divitius. Uh, or pan plutos, I like that because it's uh, it's got the alliteration of the PP, pan plutos. And we do have pan plutos. So uh, if you think of pan American, uh, we got pan plutos. And uh, this is what we have, the the, every wealth, the unlimited, infinite wealth, but it's the wealth of uh, full assurance. It's the wealth of understanding. It's the wealth of full knowledge. It's the wealth of God's mystery. And all of these ofs are linked together. And so it's more trains on our train track that we have to link together now to understand what this wealth really is. It's the infinite wealth of full assurance the infinite wealth of full assurance. And so we wanna just come together as a church and, and uh, into the storehouse of full assurance. And uh, as we obtain the full assurance, as we dispense the full assurance, as we um, just hand out full assurance willy-nilly to anyone who wants it, okay? Because uh, we, don't, we don't have any less full assurance the more we give out and just like grace, you don't have less grace, the more grace you give. You don't have less kindness, the more kindness you dispense. Uh, anytime you're dispensing God's provision, you have, you have more. It's, uh, it's more blessed to give than to receive. So the unlimited infinite wealth of full assurance. We're going to start with that. The ultimate infinite wealth of full assurance. So we're not name it and claim it prosperity gospel. We're not preaching a, a Joel Olstein type thing or a uh, not to pick on him or pick on anybody that that teaches the health, wealth, and prosperity that says, hey, you know, if you give give me a hundred dollars, you're going to get sevenfold back, or some kind of a scam, some kind of a thing that you know, cast your bread upon the waters, and here's what God promises you're going to get back. You're going to uh, and like it's a, a gimmick, it's some kind of a, a magical hocus pocus thing. No, it's not. A, it's not the kind of wealth God's giving. It's not U.S. dollars. Uh, that he's handing out the unlimited infinite wealth of playrophoria, playrophoria, and we want to we want to have this playrophoria, and uh, we should have this playrophoria. By the way, the play the playroma, the fullness, the playrao, the filling, 
we've already had several filling studies that uh, to present every man complete in Christ. The purpose of the ministry is to present every man plerao, complete in Christ. And so we realize that what comes with being made complete and, and serving in a completed way in, the, in our priesthood, the, that uh, to be made complete means that we are embracing this pleroferia. We're emb embracing this full assurance. And uh, if you don't embrace the full assurance, how can you be made complete? If you're sketchy on your doctrine, how can you be made complete? If you have no assurance of the word of God that it does what it says it will do, and uh, at that point, what are you doing? Are you walking by faith? Are you walking in a in a in a tragic ignorance of well, I hope it all works out, but I don't I don't see how it can. I hope it all works out, but I don't think it can. I don't think it will. And, and that's not full assurance. What kind of prayer life is that? When you're going to the Lord in prayer, you're you're the confidence is not in how frequently you pray. The confidence is how well you know your God, how intimate you are with Jesus Christ. The full assurance you have of of understanding him, the full knowledge of him. And if you don't know Jesus very well, then I now I understand why your prayers are so sketchy. Now I understand why you're not embracing this kind of wealth, because you don't know your Savior. You don't know our Savior. So let me introduce you to Jesus. And this is the thing. And um, the, it's, it's, it's unfortunate to me. I, I think it's sad. Maybe you don't. But I think it's sad that the um the moment of your of your conversion the moment that you cross over from darkness into light the moment you get saved the moment you become a believer at that moment of your personal regeneration that that's the only time that we use the idiom of coming to jesus of knowing jesus do you know the lord you know we use do you know the lord as a as a synonym as a as a euphemism for you know are you saved are you going to heaven when you die we say do you know the lord but there's a lot of people and we need to use that phrase do you know the lord in different ways besides just the getting saved context because there's a lot of people who have been saved for years and they don't really know the lord they came to know him they came to christ but how much growth have they done since then you know it's like uh how well do you know your wife on your wedding day? Not as well as you know her 30 years later. And that's the point. There are some people, if, if, if on your 30th anniversary, you don't know her any better than you did on your, on your, uh, at, the, at the altar, at the wedding service ceremony, if you don't know her any better on your 30th anniversary than you knew her standing in front of the, the, the pastor and taking those vows and putting on rings, why? <laughs> you know have you not spent time with her that's 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 the that's the thing and then there's folks and they're not spending time with the lord and they're not in his word they're not growing they're not walking with him they're not being tested with him they're not going through the the blood sweat and tears and the trials they don't have the full assurance and because they don't have the full assurance they're poor they are poverty stricken there is a wealth available for them, and there is a storehouse of wealth. They need to get knit together with other believers. They need to have the heart encouragement that comes being knit together. And they need to apprehend what this wealth really is. They need to apprehend the wealth of full assurance, the wealth of pleroferia. All right. So, you know, we, we want the wealth of kindness. We want the wealth of grace. We want the wealth. There's other kinds of wealth that we've seen, the wealth of, wealth of, wealth of, okay? But the wealth of pleroferia is what Colossians 2 is talking about, the wealth of full assurance. If you have the wealth of full assurance, you know what? No one can take that from you. No one can beat that out of you. They can't torture you that away from you. You're going through martyrdom. You're in jail. You're, you're being beaten. And they want you to deny Christ. How do you deny Christ when you've got a full assurance? You've got a pleroferia. You've got the full assurance of understanding. The full assurance of understanding the full knowledge of God's mystery. The full knowledge of Christ himself. Christ in you. And no one's going to talk you out of that. You know, think about what they can talk you out of. 
They can't talk me out of my salvation. I know I'm saved. I know whom I have believed and, 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 and have entrusted. I think that whole hymn is built upon this context. I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to keep that which I've entrusted to him against that day. That speaks of, of uh, eternal security and the full assurance of salvation. But more than that, it's the full assurance of our wealth in Christ. The, 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 uh, the wealth that we have, the unfathomable riches that we have in Christ. So not only do we fathom them, we have the full assurance of that which we fathom. So pleroforia, full assurance. And the full assurance that we have in the word of God, the full assurance that we have, 1 Thessalonians 1.5. Our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with pleroforia, with pleroforia. See, everywhere Paul went, he left them with pleroforia. Every flock he left, he left behind him a rich flock, a rich flock in pleroforia, full assurance, conviction. Just as you know, what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake, that that the, the Thessalonian flock was knit together. They were knit together because of the face-to-face -face ministry that Paul had in, uh, in, in ministering to them. So they had a plera phorea. Hebrews 6.11. We desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the plera phorea of hope. So we can have different kinds of pleroforia, but here's a pleroforia of hope and, and realize it until the end. So do not be sluggish, but understand, be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. This is what the writer of Hebrews was urging his audience to attain to, the pleroforia of hope. Hebrews 10, 22. Let us draw near with a sincere heart or a genuine heart in Pleroforia of faith. So we've got a pleroforia of hope, a pleroforia of faith, a pleroforia of, of um, uh, understanding. That's our one here in Colossians 2. And the pleroforia that the, uh, that the Thessalonians had, the pleroforia of uh, gospel, the good news pleroforia. So all of these, we got. Uh, pleroforia used four times in the New Testament, and in, in uh, each of those four times, it has a different object, the full assurance of understanding, the full assurance of the gospel, the full assurance of hope, and the full assurance of faith, the full assurance, which means that we're, it's not just information, okay? It's not just facts. It's, uh, it starts with that. You have to apprehend. You have to learn. But in, in receiving it, in accepting it, in embracing it, in being persuaded by it, in allowing it to do its work, you, you're letting the, the truth dwell richly within you. You see, that's, that's the, 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 the beauty of the Word of God, is that, yes, it's an academic process. Yes, it's a learning process, but it's so much more. You know, you learn, you learn how to you learn how to add two numbers together. You learn that two plus two equals four. Okay, so now you've learned that, you know that, but are you embracing that? Are you absorbing that? Are you, do you have a full assurance of that? Do you, do you so, um, are you so fully assured of two plus two equals four that it shapes your thinking, it shapes your life, it blesses you moving forward, your, your, you're standing forward in a full assurance. No, no, no. Only doctrine does that. Doctrine from the word of God, the power and wealth that comes from the word of God that you learn and you learn fully and you understand and you have the full assurance that you are a, depos a, a depository, a storehouse and a dispensary. A depository and a dispensary. I like that even better. That's a DD. Depository and dispensary. Wow, change storehouse to depository in all your slides. All right, I'm going to edit this on the fly. Now, the full assurance, the full assurance of what? The full assurance of 
understanding. The full assurance of understanding. This is why you got to have confidence. You can't just have confidence and confidence alone, right? You're not like Julie Andrews singing in Sound of Music. You know, I have confidence in uh, sunshine. I have confidence in whatever, rain. I have, I have confidence in confidence alone. How dumb is that? That's like having faith in faith. You know, if you have faith in faith, uh, you've got a groundless faith. faith. You got to have faith in the right object. You got to have faith in God. You got to have faith in His Word. You got to have faith in Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's that's the anchor for your faith. Likewise, the full assurance. If you have full assurance in nothing, then you've got full assurance of nothing. You've got to have a full assurance of the proper items that God has supplied for us to have a full assurance of. A full assurance of understanding, a full assurance of hope, a full assurance of faith, a full assurance of the gospel. Uh, all the things that we're told we can have a full assurance of in the New Testament. And since the New Testament tells us we can have a full assurance of it, we should have a full assurance of it. If the Bible doesn't tell us we should have a full assurance of, uh, we might want to be cautious. Okay? So, uh, you know, faith in God, faith in Christ, faith in his word, faith, you know, but the wrong object of your faith? You want to have faith in your pastor? Do you want to have a full assurance in your pastor? Oh, pathetic, sad, tragic. Dump that in a heartbeat. Cursed is the man who trusts in man, okay? Let's not have the full assurance in the wrong object. Let's not have faith in the wrong object. Let's have the full assurance in everything the New Testament tells us to have a full assurance in, because that's the kind of wealth we're studying this morning. It's the unlimited, infinite wealth of full assurance. Okay, full assurance of what? Full assurance of understanding. The full assurance of understanding. Oh, okay. Well, then I better understand what it is I'm supposed to understand so that I can have the full assurance of that understanding. If I don't understand it, how do I have the full assurance of what I don't understand? <laughs> you see why these things are all linked together? Why this is this train, seven or eight cars long on this train, and, and we're linking them together. The knitting starts it. The knitting encourages our hearts. And then having been knit with, with encouraged hearts or comforted hearts or exhorted hearts i think it's uh, it's not just it's it's that exhorted in, encouraged heart we're now going to apprehend this tremendous wealth that we have as a church the full assurance of understanding the full assurance of understanding the mystery and you know this is why i think it's only the dispensational tradition that has this kind of wealth Covenant theology does not have this kind of wealth. Most Reformed theology doesn't have this kind of wealth. Now, I, there are some Reformed theology that, that also is dispensational, but that's getting pretty rare. Most Reformed are, are dumping dispensations, and most Reformed are going pure covenant on mill. And being covenant on mill, they don't have the understanding of the mystery. And without the understanding of the mystery, they can't have the full assurance of the understanding of the mystery. And without the full assurance of the understanding of the mystery, they don't have the wealth. They are destitute. They are poverty stricken. You heard it here first. Covenant Amil Reformed theology is destitute, according to the wealth standard here, the pan plutos that we have in the knit together local church that is Austin Bible Church. All right. The clock has gotten away from me. We are at the end of our hour. Holy smokes. Well, this is where we'll pick up Wednesday. And I will make a note for myself that this is where we'll pick up on Wednesday with Sunesis and Luke 2.47. Father, thank you for your truth. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for this study. Reinforce it for us, Father, so that we grasp what is the wealth? What is the full assurance? What is the understanding? What is the mystery? What is the full knowledge, the epinosis of the mystery? Thank you, Father, for opening our eyes to these things. A little here, a little there. It's taken us some time, but we want to be diligent with it. Open our eyes, Father. I thank you and I praise you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.